thanks for coming. I think we have some uh, guests here from Zurich. Is that correct? Hands up from Zurich. Mm, thanks, oh, guys. Excellent. Well, That's so exciting. International. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. Uh, this is our the Sound Arts and the, our Chris App Research Center uh, ongoing series of visiting practitioners. Um, and uh, this week uh, we have uh, Louise Ashcroft, um, who isn't specifically like many of the people I've, not, not all, but some of the people I've invited this year are not necessarily, uh, wouldn't call themselves sound artists, but um, everyone on the program uses sound in an interesting way to me. Um, so uh, Louise um, did a studied fine art at Oxford University at the Ruskin uh, College and uh, then did a master's at Birkbeck uh, in cultural studies and critical studies, cultural yeah. and critical studies um, uh, and uh, is here to talk about her work. On the RCA for a bit. I did sculpture at the RCA for a bit, but I, I left in, in process after <laughs> a year, but that's a long story. It's got better now, I think. At the time, it was going through some things. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's been a bit of a rampage through. Do I w so sorry, I've <laughs> thank you. I've I'll taken over already. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. It's really nice to have a chance to talk about my work because um, I'm doing a lot of teaching at the moment and I haven't really had a chance to reflect on things that I've been doing. Um, and yeah, so I've studied in various places. My practice has spanned lots of different worlds, really, from um, flurries into comedy, um, radio, uh, workshops and relational kind of social practice. Um, but maybe sound is one of the things that that keeps it going. I like almost like if there was one thing that you couldn't remove from the work, if you said, right, I've, you have to take all everything away from the work that you don't absolutely need, then sound would be the only thing that I really would need, which is maybe why I've done quite a lot of uh, radio stuff recently and spoken word as well, but mainly the voice, I think, and using the voice to tell stories. So maybe I'm a writer, or I don't really know what I am, but that's uh, why I'm here to talk about sound. Um, I'm going to start with a little mini performance, which usually, um, usually this would be a McDonald's, um, drink or something, or from Subway or Burger King. Basically, uh, it, this is an object from Tottenham Hill Retail Park. Um, <laughs> and usually this is an object from Tottenham Hill Retail Park, if it was the McDonald's cup. And I decided that I wanted to bring these two things together because um kind of interested in subliminal messages within things or found poems or found uh, collages. Um, so I'll start. That was a, a ten second performance. Um so <laughs> I've hardly got any of those left, you see, because Poundland did it go bust or is it back again? Um it uh, I've only got about two left, so each time uh, it becomes less possible to do that. Um and uh for me it's really interesting the fact that just by bringing two objects together you could sort of hack each of them and and maybe it's a slightly literal um questioning of consumerism and uh, impending climate change and uh, and maybe the violence that goes with the casual repetitions of buying a cup of tea and 
throwing the thing away. You know, the, the small acts of violence that actually lead up to um, major uh, world problems and uh, perhaps they're the things that create the big situations rather than, um, than kind of large gestures. So I'm interested in small acts of resistance as well and ways of uh, subverting the status quo in order to... Um, in order to kind of suggest alternative ways of being in the world. Um, sometimes I've worked with young people, so I did this residency at Tate um, Modern and Tate Britain, which was for one year, and there was about four artists that were doing this throughout the year. Um, we worked together sometimes, we worked on our own. The great thing about it was that the department, which was the learning um, and schools visits department, they're quite a radical department and they really, they really respected the space of the workshop as a space for practice rather than just an add-on to the other proper artwork that was going on at Tate. Like they, re they, within the hierarchy of the organization, the kids that were visiting from local schools were up there with the, m the most important people that were there because they knew that that was their way of reaching different audiences who'd never really gone to galleries before and might not have done if they hadn't have been phoned up by Tate and asked if their school wanted to come along. So uh, I started writing, um, playing around with newspapers really with them and um, with the different schools that visited and trying to use the newspaper uh, as a way of asking whether nonsense could be political. And um, some of the shows that were on at Tate at that time, there was a floor that was all about um, politics and direct action. And um, I was really interested in the thought that maybe confusion and, uh, and nonsense could create a need to respond that is uh, more active than if someone just told you to do something. So um, this is an example of it, um, which they asked me not to ever show to anyone. Um, but then I decided it's OK if you do it, if I haven't put it on my website or anything. So I just show people in secret like this. And it, because they, the Tate said that the kids that made it with me own it as well. So I'd have to get permission from all of them and all their parents, and all, which I quite liked. It wasn't just that we were writing to David Cameron and that was a bit transgressive. It was the fact that somehow there was collective ownership of this thing. So I think it was justified, but I'm sure the kids wouldn't mind if I show you. So we started writing to David Cameron, but instead of asking for what we actually wanted, we would just uh, take uh, nouns and verbs and adjectives from the newspaper and we would recombine them. So each sentence is written by a different kid. It went over onto the next page as well and uh, they'd all signed it with like little, in little kids writing with all their names with hearts in the eyes and things like that. It was, it was kind of cute but also because the newspaper is full of violence anyway, suddenly you realize that everything that they're writing is, is really, really disturbing. And the kids had the, this capacity to write horror that really I don't think any other age group has. So they were probably about seven or eight or something. And um, I really like the thought that David Cameron would be receiving um, this at um, his prime minister's office. And it probably would get through... Um, it would go through security and it would have lots of trigger words. So maybe it wouldn't get to him. But if it did get to him, he would have to work out what this thing was asking of him rather than writing to him and saying, we want you to spend more on education, which is just, you know, people are say asking for things all the time. But what happens if you send something that suggests things but doesn't actually have that clarity? Could that... Um, force him to take responsibility for interpreting something himself. And so maybe that um, ethically is a more interesting position um, than, than just, you know, a demand. So that was kind of an important uh, residency for me because it started me thinking about how I could be public in different ways. And that's, for me, important because... I guess I am more interested in non-gallery spaces than gallery spaces, but my work exists in both. Um, there's a thing here. I'll just leave it on. I won't go into full screen. I don't really need to. Um, I've done things like cover the whole of Margate Beach with um, with sea shanty um, text 
for the whole of a day kind of attempting to create this score from um, just a stick. I quite like the idea that you could just make art with a stick or nothing, or art that costs no money, um, that doesn't need to be slick or have high production values, that just is from being there. Like in the way that you have the Duchamp ready-made, what happens if you don't even bring the thing into the gallery, but you just go out into the world and notice things and retell them? Um, let's go up here. And so for a while, I was doing these gestures that maybe were artworks or maybe were something else. But so I would, in very small ways, disrupt public space by doing things like taking um, some some perfume around with me. And every time I'd go past a statue, I would spray the stonework of all the statues in London with the perfume um, over many years, in fact, um, until the, the statues gradually became imbued with the perfume. Um, and uh, I like this thought that maybe people didn't really notice it or might slightly notice it, or but just that all these statues are, are flavored. And, and it, it was quite feminine fragrance as well, so it felt like there was an interesting gender subversion there, that they were finding their feminine sides. And these mostly quite macho sculptures. And this uh, went to that one, was a thing that I've been doing for many years as well, where I would take a vegetable, buy a vegetable in um, a market like Ridley Road Market um, in Dalston, or any of the, in fact, even in Elephant and Castle, you could get uh, an African or Asian vegetable that maybe someone in Tesco's might know what might not know what that was. Um, and I would take the mysterious, unfamiliar to me vegetable into a Tesco's or an Asda or some kind of mainstream high street supermarket and attempt to buy it along with the rest of my um, shopping in order to disrupt the... Uh, the system with its own logic so that the the shopkeepers or the, the till people had to then ask, oh, what's this? Where did you find it? What should I put it under? And then they asked their supervisor and the supervisor has to make a decision. Well, what, where's, what is this? It's not on the system. And then maybe they go to their manager and then eventually you get to meet the manager of the whole of Oxford's Marks and Spencer's Simply Food. And so I started to uh, talk to different levels of the hierarchy uh, within the shop and um, and expose the system itself by, by just putting a little spanner in the works in a quite friendly way. I think for me, it released the frontline staff from their duty as machines and robots. Because um, when I started it, it was just at the time of introducing the beep through um, uh, self-service machines, which if you're using those, it doesn't work as well now. So it's becoming increasingly impossible to make this work. Also, I'm running out of places to do it in. Um, so if people in Zurich want to do that or inform me there, that would be really helpful because I can't be everywhere. In fact, all of these things, those, um, they're really just, they're not necessarily documented. I have documented the objects to an extent like this, but I don't really see them as being things that are like a work that sits in a gallery. They're more like recipes for things that everyone could do um, to slightly shift reality. So this is, for a while I was posting stuff that I found in Mayfair on the floor. So the surface of, the f of all the detritus and um, litter and dust that uh, covers the surface of Mayfair um, in central London and posting it to Gerald Cavendish Grosvenor, who is the owner of most of Mayfair. He's the aristocratic uh, landlord of that space who's based in Chester. And I thought, well, to him, it's just uh, probably an asset on an Excel spreadsheet. He probably doesn't go to Mayfair that much. He's in his mansion. And so I like the thought that I would be sending him. He would receive, with no information, just uh, all of these different things, and who'd get to experience the physicality of being in those streets. So it's sort of antagonistic, but also I feel like slightly using a, 
affection or generosity um, as a tool for um, questioning or picking at hierarchies. Um, what's that one? That's the oh, that's the potato. That is kind of a sequel to that one. Where so it's you can do it actually. Go to Morrison's or Azor or anywhere. Buy the buy a potato from the loose potato section. Uh, take it for walks and excursions. Take it to cultural events. Take it to lectures and then just put it back in uh, where it was and that someone will eat it for dinner not knowing how much it's experienced. <laughs> um, so, And this is an anti-crowd device that I made where I... Um, so I made a series of anti-crowd devices to use on the underground um, because I thought... I was quite interested in crowds at the time and I thought that, um, that if you could separate the individual from the crowd. There was something interesting sculpturally in that. Um, and also the, the fact that when, I'm interested in personal space boundaries and uh, it's about three foot the personal space boundary for in, in Britain, in other countries it might be different. Um, but yeah, you, you tend to keep people that aren't in your immediate inner circle um, three foot away from you. So I'd made all these contraptions that stopped people getting close to me and I would be like on the tube with them and they would just be get crushed in an instant um, and no one even noticed or cared or it was just like crush. And um, but then I started wearing one of these masks as I went around it and people t uh, kept an average of four foot <laughs> distance. And what have we got? So these are these kind of, I call them props and the way that I would show them really is like this in uh, festivals, uh, um, they're growing all the time. There's always new ones. So telling the story of the action is the way that the work is mostly presented. That was just amplifying my footsteps to the volume of a giant. Um, hiding chocolate coins in roadwork uh, holes uh, to give the illusion that the builders or the road workers have found buried treasure just for a moment. Um, that was a bouquet of flowers that was from all of the corporate flower displays uh, in London and outside the Ritz Hotel and um, yeah, kind of corporate bouquet. That's a switch that I carry around sometimes which just when it's on, uh, it heightens my aesthetic awareness of the world and when it's off, it um, I, I become less aware. I quite like the placebo effect of just sort of having a switch that you could you can actually control your own senses just by deciding that certain ones are switched on or off at, at different times. And that's probably what you all do in that for you sound is more important, whereas we live in a sort of scopophile um, visual culture generally. That's the dominant sense, I think. Um, so there is like a hierarchy to the senses as well. This was... Uh, to remind me, oh it was my friend's uh, photography glove for going through her negatives and um, photographs and she uh, sort of borrowed it forever um, because it reminded me that actually pointing is photography or like for me, for me seeing like little kids point at stuff, like little kids don't have kids but I I've done quite a lot of um, of family residencies in places like Tate and Camden Arts Centre, and um, just that the power of that pointing uh, gesture, I'm really interested in, and it seems because it's just so direct. You don't need to necessarily make something; just notice things um, and ask questions. So, the glove, uh, I think that's there to remind me of of this gesture that I did, where I would just walk all the way to Canary Wharf from um, Greenwich, just pointing at the tallest tower, one Canada Square, um, until I get to the, the entrance to the, the tallest tower, which is like built so that it can be seen from everywhere in London. Its status is, I in a very literal way, just comes from the fact that it is the biggest. Um, but then as soon as you get up to the door, the, um, the security guard uh, who's usually this woman on weekends, I do it on weekends, um, she would just come and like, and stop, like cover my finger, just like sort of stop me. Like, so it's this strange thing that you couldn't, 
it said like look at me look at me everyone look at me in the whole of london and the whole of the world but as soon as you did it became a security threat um so you could kind of over that's the smallest most free most simple way that you could somehow take on big power like the big power of of banking of big capitalism i'm really trying to overthrow big capitalism single single-handedly but i'm also really aware of the cliche of the artist or s someone trying to you know like question capitalism in in uh, but without pr really providing an alternative um so i'm trying to get inside of um of systems like shopping centers banking spaces this i found in the so in um i did a residency in westfield shopping center in um stratford by the olympic park and this is just a little deviation towards that so the outside tk maxx there were these big posters that were uh trying to sell clothes but i noticed that the more it was in the shopping center which was i was there for about six months just not every day but maybe one day a week um noticing what was there uh and i found a lot of kind of climate change imagery around like so this is outside tk maxx but she's on this this cracked earth sort of desert landscape um, and there was lots, there were lots of things like that. Lots of the more that you notice that there might be some kind of apocalyptic um, imagery happening, the more you saw. And I was leading these tours of the shopping centre, but they were performance tours. Um, people could come along, and we'd use the shopping centre as a studio space almost to do a series of act actions and gestures and make little sculptures without using anything up in the process. But we just, we kind of see what we could get away with in that space um, because it's so full of materials you don't need to buy anything ever again as an artist just just use the um, shopping center as a studio space and one of the um the members of the public that came along um we were looking at things we were looking at that earlier image there of the cracked earth and on her leg just below that um you can see she's wearing the yellow coat um she had a tattoo that I hadn't seen. So one of the participants was like, what's that tattoo on her leg? And we looked and it said, trust no one or trust nobody. And then this um, icon of the spaceship. So it's sometimes I think what I've learned, it, the most important thing that I've learned maybe is that you don't actually have to, you don't have to make things up because it's already there for you. Um, this is, a book that I was in, just to show that my my um, my practice could sit within a comedy context as well. But like, there was loads of famous comedians in this book, and then I got to be in this book telling a joke, a really bad joke, I think, about like sp something to do with spiders or something. Or I don't know. Anyway, oh no, maybe they didn't put that one in the end. Anyway, I like to take a lot of Proclus and Calms simultaneously so that they balance out. And I feel intensely normal. Um, dig a hole in the ground and bury your head in it. So you wear the whole earth as a giant mask. It's kind of not the stuff that the other comedians were doing, but somehow managed to s be accepted as a comedian just because I happened to be doing a gig that was a comedy gig. And yet I have no right really to be and not like on that circuit really it just happened to be in the right place at the right time and maybe that's the thing that i like doing the most is just getting out there and being allowing synchronicity or chance to happen this is a thing that so i also like to create tools that allow other people to get out of there as well and um, maybe like rewriting the way that we use a particular space so like in the westfield shopping center um it then became a performance space i'd also made um i'll show you an image in a minute but i've made this shopping center game called morlopoly which was kind of like monopoly but for to play in the shopping center it wasn't really actually structurally like monopoly it was more like 
uh, a card-based game with dares and instructions that were that you had to do kind of games in the in the shops, but they all related to something to do with the politics of that space. But uh, I'll show you in a minute an image of that. The this is a resource thing that I made for the as part of the school's residency thing at Tate, and um, so is a way of making the pre-Raphaelite room more accessible to kids, but also anyone, I think. I don't know why this is always for kids, because actually I find that when I've worked recently with adults creating kind of speculative or fantasy situations, they're just as able to do it. They just don't get a space to do it normally. So last week, at, or the week before, I was working with people in their 80s and even maybe 90s in um, Salisbury doing a, this speculative life planning work where we had to imagine what it would be like if we had spent our lives together. So role play happens a lot with kids, but I think I'm really interested in taking it into an adult context as well. But this was for kids. So walk around the 1840 room, which is full of faces from myth and history. Look for characters in the artworks. Choose the character who most intrigues you. Uh, and you basically have to imagine that you go on holiday with one of the characters from the paintings, but you use chance to randomly select paintings in each room to give you clues to how your holiday develops. Um, so like chance is really important to me, um, and but also using chance to kind of um, spark off things that are already there in your head that you might not have realized. So almost like a psychoanalytical function of, I guess that's what surrealism is, isn't it? You play games, mess around, use chance, roll a dice in order to uh, structure the invention of alternate realities. Um, what else have we got to show you? Oh, there's the Morlopoly. Um, so lots of little things that you got to do that related to um, some of the political, I mean, I've there's no point in going into it. If you want one, I think I've got quite a lot, they're not with me, but you could always email me and I can, if you send a stamped address envelope, I can probably send you one. Um, there's about eight different things that you have to do in that space. Um, so the Westfield Shopping Centre, uh, res it was kind of a residency again, but I don't, I didn't have permission from Westfield. I just went there a lot. Um, and so maybe it's field work, but it's, I like to call it a residency because it feels more like, I don't know, kind of more like work. Um, but then generally, if I feel like I'm at work when I'm making my work, it doesn't work so maybe that's wrong um anyway i don't know i don't quite i've, I've confused myself there this is um s an installation that went alongside some of the shopping center based work so that morlopoly game is on there and people could take them away is an arbite gallery in um at the time it was in hackney wick so just by the shopping center and there was also a lot of boats, narrow boats along the River Lee, which were right by the shopping center and right by the gallery. And so I thought, what would happen if you played the language of the shopping center through the language of the boat signs that were, all of the boats had these hand-painted enamel signs. So um, when I was in the shopping center, I noticed that loads of t-shirts had phrases on them. Like um, It was that moment where all t-shirts had a little mini poem um, and I collected them all and then worked with a sign painter to um, to really laboriously remake these slogans from mass fast fashion into these boat signs so it's more it is again it's a kind of collage work but a way of slowing down the pace of something um, or playing something through something else in the way that I did with the, the pig and the um, the drink. Um, so it also had some of the t-shirts here. Um, and I did make a little video work about that. I'll maybe I can show, oh, I want to show you some video. Maybe I'll have a little 
momentary break while I show you a, a video of a video of that. Um, probably like for me, one of the best things that I made as a result of that shopping center residency. So here we are. I noticed that there was unicorns everywhere in the shopping center. Like the mainly the shopping center only sold things with unicorns on it. Um, so I kind of overanalyzed these. H&M heraldry. When all the other animals are extinct, we can rely on the unicorn, can't we? It can't die because it was never really born. Survival of the fictitious. Faux fur, fur foes, misfits seek allegiance, paradoxically. And the unicorn is a fitting mascot, unique like everyone else. Ubicorn, ubicorn, ubiquity. Relinquishing responsibility with stage naivety. And it's ironic, isn't it? But it's not, though. Catacorns, for those who need a familiar. Survival decoys, hidey holes where you can escape the gallows humour of the mall, the place which for the most part can't be bothered with niceties anymore. It knows you'll never leave anyway, you don't know how to make it on your own. And so here we are, foraging through its omens. Grey wigs in teenage chains, graven watches, cues without endings. Don't let me make you feel insecure, though. There are guards here to protect you. She's got that don't judge me by my t-shirt off her chest. He's just checking. Regulated wildness. You chase your dinner around the plate to trigger primordial pleasure points. Keep chasing. Werewolves. Fierceness. Yearning for your inner animal. But he's gone to habitat. The great indoors, wild quotations that don't stand up anymore, disorientated conglomerate landscapes kicked over by unicorn hoof shadows. But you're in 24-7-365 luminosity. The lights don't even go out here. You're applying photo filters that transplant nocturnal sources where your aging eyes were. Cuteness epidemic, post-corporeal interspecies offspring. Screen size, so more can fit in the arc when the waters rise. But the closer you get, the further the arc appears. Farther and farther. Pigeons are rainbow coloured if you look up close. Let's get out of here then, somewhere, anywhere. Only aliens believe in us now. They say the first stage is denial. Immortal skins on skeletons. Elizabeth I kept a unicorn horn in her cabinet. A fake, probably a narwhal tusk. It was a big market for them then. Serious explorers scoured the globe hunting for mythical beasts. Gotta catch them all. Divide all the matter in the world up into unicorn-shaped chunks. The second phase is acceptance. Swap the fantasy for firearms. Capitalist masochism. We are warriors, rebels, uncapturable, free with a giant barcode on the arm and the brand name, supply and demand. Brands brazenly quoting the economic strategies that they've used to reify your life hours. Honest is the best disguise. Open wounds, all red and dead. They never hid the bloodied corpse. Poisonous poissons and flies all over the victim, glistening like jewels named after strains of the plague released from the ice. Deep time, trapped in polished limestone, teeming with tiny fossilized shells, mini unicorn horns perhaps, monuments to extinction. Desert islands to strand yourself on. No days off, running out of time to talk, so you've summarized your thoughts. Statements of the subconscious outsourced to Indonesia. Apathy as agency. You invest in your own insecurities, even if it makes them worse. Narcissism, inadequacy, fear of intimacy, want, loneliness, exploitation, delusions of grandeur, greed, boredom, hopelessness, failure, confusion. It's called Stockholm Syndrome, I think. In love with the oppressor, moths and flames, and there are thousands of them here. They come out at night and eat holes in your top shop. They help the wolves shred the garments when the customers have gone, ghosting lands that beasts once roamed, savagery cells. Feeling hunted makes us more alive. 28 days later with a receipt. I'll just say a couple, they've both got all holes in their trousers. You'd put them in the bin. <laughs> You should have left the eyes on or painted them in. Ceremonies where totem poles get souls. The princesses are dizzy and little Miss Muffet is beefing up on way. Outsourced stomachs, wasted wastes and altered to bubble tea above the bin. Miniature universe growing inconveniently in one of its vials. 
health and safety are onto it. Rainbow amniotic fluid, is this where unicorns come from? They're too individualistic for procreation. They sit procreating and pretend that it's the milk of virgins because that's what unicorns live on. Farmed in labs now, above the bins, there's nothing like entropy to make the chandeliers look shinier. And down by the toilets, a shrine to the urban deprivation elsewhere in the borough, chronicles of abandoned fridges, sofas and ironing boards let us know that we're the chosen ones here. Slum tourism works both ways. See how the poorer half live and then get the bus back there. Fly tipping, try flipping. There's a little portal at the back of Hollister which predicts a future where waters rise around us, bodies struggling to stay afloat. There's no land left except the deserts, cracked earth beneath the parched bodies of models. just spending loads of time there and getting like more and more sad <laughs> and um, more and more confused by the space which doesn't really have windows and which is overstimulating in every possible way and kind of making connections between things that I noticed and then really tightening that up into I guess I suppose the process was collect things I've noticed write them down take photos and then go and just spend a whole day or more trying to write it up and tighten it up and kind of make a poem out of it and then uh throughout i had been videoing just on the gopro and because you can't really video with a proper camera even a phone it would stop you so um trying to make it as direct as possible i think um s sometimes i wonder whether i need to up my production values but then i kind of know that for me a hundred pound camera um, and my phone and my finger and like my brain like that's that's enough really so um, yeah I don't know whether that limits my career or what but for me it's really important that it has that feeling of being undercover and just being small even um, rather than trying to make a super slick film about about that subject which is is kind of the language of the shopping centre anyway. Um, so the lo-fi is important, um, but I think it's it most of the work stems from writing. This might be relevant to you in that, um, so I recently did a performance at CCA, which is a new space, a new gallery space uh, opposite Goldsmiths. It's part of Goldsmiths. Um, so it's a piece called Talking to a Brick Wall, in which uh, I, Let's just make that bigger. Maybe it will show. So me and my friend Fritha, um, we used the walls of the gallery as a, a musical score, I suppose. I had this piece of metal which made kind of crashing sounds and sort of as you dragged it around the walls of this very old, renovated uh, industrial space that's now a gallery, um, the the metal sort of picked up those sounds. So it was a kind of percussion instrument that felt slightly industrial. And then Fritha was playing the violin, but really kind of interpreting the undulations of the wall um, as a score. And um, the audience had to do various little challenges, like they were doing rubbings of the walls um, and then interpreting the details that they'd found and trying to create little narratives from those um eventually we were kind of chanting these short stories that they'd written through their interpretations of details of the wall and we were chanting them at the building and trying to kind of knock down the building um using the chanting it was quite strange i'm not sure how i feel about it i really like the use of the um violin and playing it as a score i'm not sure that like the, the, the workshop nature of it was I felt like people's interpretations of the details of the wall were not that exciting. They were things like, it's a bit spongy, or, but I wanted it to be this fantastical narrative where they'd noticed like the shape of a rabbit's ear and then they'd kind of, f 
felt um, a particular landscape or like I wanted them to go really far with their interpretation of what the surface of this wall might kind of conjure in their minds. But I think people were a bit nervous to go far with it. And so it was it wa it was interesting, but it was more interesting in abstract ways than through narrative. And most of my work is narrative based. So for me that was uncomfortable. But I think it, I'd really like to do more um, wall wall performing. So more kind of because it's full of information. Um, it's it tells this history, but in a very material way. Um, maybe there's scope for me to do some kind of walk where I I go and visit. Um, well, maybe walk the whole of Britain, kind of playing the surface of the land. Um, with various instruments and with various different tools of interpretation. Um, let's see. Let me talk about this then. Um, so I've done for a while a piece that um, is called Why Don't We Live Together, um, which so it's a kind of cleaning service where I go to people's houses and they book me. They just I just promote it and then they book me for free. I go to their houses. I spend an hour with them and we clean together in their house um, while we plan how we'd spend the rest of our lives together. And it isn't awkward. <laughs> it is a bit awkward for the first two minutes, but because you're cleaning, it doesn't feel awkward. And it's not always like you'd be married to, the, to them, or like it doesn't have to be a sexual relationship. It almost never is, because that would be kind of awkward. But it's um, it. Although once one of the people that asked me to, one of the strangers that I went to, I'd like Google them before to check if they're safe, because that's a great way to stay safe. Like like I, like I can know. But so this guy had. His that he books that he's he'd published came up, and one was Confessions of a Sex Addict. I was like, okay, maybe I should. I don't know. This is like a weird title. Does that make me feel uncomfortable? Um, but then I just thought I'd go in anyway, and he was actually really nice. And it was also he was also a gay sex addict, so he was. I said, oh, I was re I was relieved when I found out that he I was probably okay. He was like, don't presume. I was like, okay, but um, it was interesting going into people's spaces and. Um, having that normally uh, the viewer comes to the gallery or I really like the idea that the, the gallery goes to people in their homes or actually I wasn't even really an artist in that situation. I was as much a viewer as the viewer and so the word viewer is ridiculous anyway, it especially for you lot. Like you understand, you feel the pain. of. For me, I don't really like the passive nature of the word viewer that somehow there's a distance and you're an onlooker or a spectator or what about there must be other words um i think listener is really nice but also it could be listener and speaker or responder or just like person like maybe the word artist and even the word art just takes something away from us uh even though it does give us permission to be outside of the normal parameters of behavior um so yeah, this is a version of that, um, and I'd done it in lots of different places. I'd cleaned out all kinds of different basements, and I'd helped someone move move house, and it was really quite easy to come up with fictional possible lives that we might have, but really based in what things that people had wanted to do but never really had a chance to do. So I'd set up fictional businesses with people. Uh, we would found museums together, we would go on journeys together, all of these things that people would do if they didn't have the responsibilities that they had or if they had made different life choices. Um, so, because I always get that feeling, oh, I wish I had like a hundred lives or I, I don't want, it's a sort of life greed. And even just going into a news agents and buying a chocolate bar, I walk out and think, <gasps> What about all of the other chocolate bars? Have I made the right choice? And so for me, that piece is a way of having all of the lives, but only for an hour. So that's even better because you don't ha you don't have to commit to it. Um, so there's a sort of like platonic um, polyamory. Although some of them were my boss, some of them were. It, so it wasn't always even friendship. It was um, in the lives we created. There were all kinds of different ways of relating to one another and. Uh, yeah, it was a sort of, mm, yeah, polyamory without the amory bit, the book, 
like many lives um kind of yeah journey through all these and it f i found it really interesting but this is a piece that i made that's a little bit like that called all our lives and uh it is basically a questionnaire um with you can see that there's like it's hard to see but there's a font made of socks and uh saying all our lives and i'm very proud of the sock font the there's lots of socks uh in a basket which uh the viewers or the two people that are invited to play. So for one day I was there, this is in Salisbury Arts Centre, but in the cafe space of the Arts Centre. Uh, I was there for a day and people could uh, plan imaginary lives with me while, while um, pairing up socks together. Um, but then it worked when I wasn't there as well because people could do that together and it had step-by-step -step instructions and questions about their life. So you could go you could get you were eased into it a little bit more because it's quite hard to get people to kind of rev up so that they know how they could even begin talking about their fictional lives together but it sort of it really worked when people played it but people have been quite scared to approach it all these objects are um things that i selected from the arts center's theater prop room um and they all relate to um to the questionnaires that people filled in telling details of their fictional lives. Um, and so I'm then going to, maybe in the next couple of weeks, write up all of the forms. So there's information about the, the lives that they, that they invented together on the forms, all written um, in pen. And so I will make some kind of... Uh, script i suppose play script which amalgamates details of these lives and uh just from looking through the things i've already got on the questionnaires i'd selected a bunch of props that related to the fictional lives so um so it's going to be a play script with uh, instructions of which props to use from that theater space so sometimes i use it creates situations in order to create texts or stories that are often collectively authored, even if there's not consent in that authorship. So, for example, by hacking capitalism or whatever, by by um, intervening in the status quo, I activate the space in a different way, which then results in a story, which I then retell. Um, I don't want to... You know, we'll we'll kind of do another... A little bit more, but then I want to get you guys to do something um, so it's not just me talking all the time. Let's just go back and see. I was um, oh, so I'm going to whiz through a few things just to give like bite-sized tasters. I've done quite a bit of radio stuff, and you can listen to it another time. But on the BBC uh, website, so I started doing this gig almost every year, really, or for a few years. Um, called The Boring Conference, and um, it's kind of a little cult conference, comedy conference, really, um, that is organised by uh, a comedian called James Ward, who's obsessed with stationery and pens and post-it notes and everything to do with stationery. And so he organised it as, apparently there was an interesting conference that was organised several years ago, maybe like, almost 10 years ago now and the interesting conference got cancelled at the last minute so he organized he was like right i'm gonna i'm gonna organize a boring conference instead and so that got this cult following and every year it happens now in conway hall which is quite a big old um hall in um holborn and it's got like the upper stage but it's got sort of the circle at the top you know the upper seats and then it's it's a big kind of lecture room and um so I started doing talks about things that I was interested in that were boring. So this one that you can listen to another time is uh, about the Argos catalogue. But it so the Argos catalogue, shopping catalogue, for those that don't know it, often it lives in people's toilets and is like leafed through. Like uh, it's sometimes in childhood. I guess it's a, it's dying out because of the internet. Um, but it was the kind of thing that 
me and my sister and lots of our friends and lots of people I've spoken to would sort of flick through and dream about things that they might get for Christmas or things they might buy when they were older and richer. And so it's strange aspirational space and quite an adventurous space for, for me, this shopping catalogue. But also it kind of, it reveals what we value, um, how tastes have changed and like the stories and ideas that are the things that we buy when we buy stuff because it's not really the stuff that has that much value most things are made out of the same materials really like plastic or wheat or like there's not that many materials like um it's more of the ideas that are attached to those materials that are the things that we desire so um, it becomes quite mythical, a little bit like the video that you saw about unicorns in Westfield. It becomes quite mythical in the Argos catalogue talk. Um, and yeah, I think over analysis of what's there is a really useful tool for me. Um, this is a piece called One Hour Holiday, which um, I wish you were here, One Hour Holiday. So I've done it a few times now, I've done it three times. Um, sometimes think well what does the audience need what does the public need it's all right me just saying look at my art but what about if they actually there's something that I can give them that they want uh, or that they don't have time for in their lives so uh, this one hour holiday project I basically we do all the things that we would do if we went on holiday to some far away exotic location that becomes clear as we do a series of games and activities where we decide or kind of read our surroundings and use chance and games to try and work out what the holiday was um, together. So it's a live writing experiment, really, an improvised writing experiment. Um, and this was a great holiday in Bermondsey. It, it was in Bermondsey, and we ended up with this like kombucha or something. I was, we did have a really fun, quite sunny day. We ended up on the banks of the Thames, but um, it was really just a group walk with a series of different exercises where we tried to discover the story of our journey and the things that we did on this holiday. So it's a little bit like the Tate piece for kids that where you plan a holiday with, um, with a pre-Raphaelite character from a painting. Um, and I did one in Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre as well, which was hugely successful, except that w only one person came to it. <laughs> so it was really nice. We went in um, all of the like South American... Um, there's quite a lot of community spaces which are restaurants and bars, but um, they're like very specific to a particular uh, South American country or like Central American country, and um, it w it felt really adventurous. And it was with an activist who I has been really vocal in protect trying to protect that shopping centre, which is now I don't know. I'm it's it's a complex story that shopping centre. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure where I stand on it anymore, but um, it uh, was really interesting to just be in that shopping centre space with a stranger and to uh, to do similar things to what I did on the group holiday. Um, we were going to go on a really big walk, but the woman who was the only audience member only wanted to be in the shopping centre. So in the end, we just stayed within there and we found that we could visit almost the whole world just by being in that space. Um, Quickly whiz through. This is a thing on a train that I did, which was in Hastings. Uh, so it was a public consultation, a, f a spoof public com consultation, um, kind of council department that uh, was proposing that there would be a sea monster that was encouraged to live in Hastings, which is a seaside town. So um, dark tourism is a growing kind of tourism people want to go to Auschwitz people want to go to like Hiroshima people like to go to traumatic places where really bad things have happened um and so and like the Loch Ness monster uh makes so much money for Loch Ness that is almost the only reason that you might go there or the main reason and so I thought well how could we regenerate Hastings and it became this ridiculous idea that could almost be believable where um 
this. So it was very kind of bureaucratic, but I was dressed as this very homemade sea monster with sea monster sound effects from different um, 60s and 70s low budget films about monsters. And the people who look really actually quite scared in this photo uh, weren't expecting performance. I was just going there and back between St. Leonard's and Hastings for the whole of two days. And um, they had to feel inside of this pillowcase of um, of objects and they had to describe what they felt in order to then um, kind of harvest from their unconscious these sea monsters. So they might feel like a little, a bit of, I don't know, some some kind of, there was one of those things that's, you know, one of those sound making toys that you go like this with and it goes like, and it's like a big long tube. There's something like that. So it's kind of like a long strange neck. There was like some socks, some mainly just all the things that I always have right, when I have a bag like that. You felt in, it and so there were different textures and they would be like, oh, I think it's got massive eyes and it's got like, and it breathes uh, in this particular way. And it's got, it really quickly, they actually were quite able to describe a sea monster uh, and they weren't that phased by it. Some people were, it was quite a deprived little area. Like, uh, though there's lots of people that are that have kind of problems. Like, um, there's quite a lot of social problems and alcohol abuse and drugs and things around the area. So it was a bit like I found it really difficult because you'd occasionally get a very hostile response, but. 90% of the time, because people just think you're taking the piss or they don't know what it is or they think you're asking for money or it's some charity stunt and they're like, I don't have anything, so I can't. And um, so it was really unclear as to what it was, whereas I just presumed, oh, well, it's performance art. You know, I think anyone in London, even people that don't necessarily like art or haven't been that exposed to art, um, they would not be phased by seeing someone dressed as something weird on the tube or in the street. But in Hastings, even though it has a really great uh, arts festival called Coastal Currents um, every year, it still was something that they didn't know how to place, which I found really useful because for me, that takes away that problem that is the gallery. Like, as soon as the, all of this, Tate stuff that I did with the kids was just a way of getting rid of the gallery and its rules like, um, in order for them to actually access art in a way that was genuine and unique to them and rather than them thinking oh we're supposed to be quiet in this space with this isn't somewhere where we can we c we can retitle all of the artworks which we would I would do that with them I would kind of allow them to just put post-it notes over the titles of all the artworks in Tate and we would I would be like, this is your collection. It's owned by the public. It's owned by you. It is not an authority over you. Um, and so either by messing with the, with galleries or um, misbehaving in galleries or going outside of the gallery altogether, I feel like you can have a fresher way of experiencing um, work. Um, just do a couple more things. Or maybe I will finish with showing you would you be able to watch like another video thing and then we'll do something interactive it is it's a teeny it's a little bit longer than the last one like is I'll, I'll just show you it i think it's fine it's not boring but it's a bit longer uh it's like it's like 20 minutes long but we can see how it goes um and then we'll do something interactive so it will have about We'll have like 40 minutes, which is fine, I think. So this is a recent thing that I did, um, which was in response to a residency in Deptford for Deptford X Festival. Um, and the market itself, like the, the second-hand market, but really kind of the house clearance market. So people just getting rid of all the contents of a house, um, usually after someone's died. Um, that was the most... It was a space I always kept coming back to when I um, was thinking about what to do in response to Deptford. So I'll show you this and and then we'll do something. Um, where are we? Enter full screen. Is, is it like a leg for a no, pirate? No, you stick it in the ground and stick a, uh, stick a washing machine. I mean, a washing dryer thing. 
My mum had lovely curtains. The woman in the Deptford documentary choruses in Death March Minor, she's reciting the 60s when it was less flower power, more funeral wreath for Deptford, declared a slum in the name of modernist utopia and raised to the ground once more post-war. She protects the frail ghosts of blitz survivors by drawing her mother's curtains blind. I scan through archival rubble atop dismembered limbs. They'd be worth an arm and a leg now, these terrified terraces, I think. First came the peace parties and then the government wrecking balls. Shattered. Window panes. She describes the nervous breakdown she suffered after the compulsory purchase orders of her mum's and neighbour's lovely curtains when the council demolished a community on grounds of them having outdoor loos. And later, surveyors' reports emerged declaring that the housing was in good nick after all, or so the biased documentary narrator explains, teasing out the shame that crushes this velvet curtain woman as she explains how house-proud her neighbours were back in the day, scrubbing the front steps each morning deemed the grates unwashed just because they had wc's in the yard when you've got to go you've got to go and these houses they had to go other london councils they gave out grants to install indoor bathrooms because there's nothing more civilised, is there, than toilets within the house, cesspits where you sleep, what's more refined than shitting inside or having an apologetic we inches away from your other half who's in the bath, radiating radox, muddied by face mask, she mistakes the sound of your toilet trickles for her rainforest mindfulness playlist. Like a fish growing legs, she stews herself in sanctuary slime, reversing evolution in the name of progress in the bathroom of a colourful eight-storey apartment block named the Tinderbox for the Tinder generation, who live in each other's pockets but they rarely see eye to eye. This brightly coloured Tinderbox building is part of a scheme called the Deptford Project. Project as in art, not American slum, and I wonder if the conversations and friendships that I'm building with locals, if they're just projects too recalling the comedy series Portlandia, which satirises subcultures of alternative Oregon in the USA. It's a bit like Deptford. A sketch about relational art where everything is revealed to in fact be an art project, the criminals are traffic wardens and, and even people's friendships, and Carrie's parents admit that they only conceived her as an art project. They reveal a gallery label on their living room wall that she'd never noticed before and it features Carrie's name and underneath it the dimensions and medium, egg and sperm. Two rich art collectors appear and they've bought her. Carrie's mum's house is sentimentally in the 70s, like Little Nan's Bar by Deptford Station, where the people who live in the tinderbox block, they gather to feel at home because, like the woman in the Deptford documentary, they don't see their mum's curtains anymore. They're in Dartford or father and father and their mum's got the same curtains as them now anyway, so they might as well just look at their own. Ikea 2018, rainbow blinds named Dorothy. Dorothy was a grandmother's name, but this one has an umlaut on it. Bright colours look contemporary, don't they? But primaries are primeval. We grew colour vision to forage reds and ambers amongst greens. Stop, get ready, go. And where did it lead? To a story of house shares and shareholds with not much to share and not much to hold, an I for an I and a, a U for a U bend and an IOU for a mortgage provider that you'll never meet because he's way up high above the food chain, somewhere over his rainbow-coloured meeting booths, each named after a Billingsgate, a Spitalfield or a Petticoat Lane. He's looking for pots of gold, but you can't be mad at his technical dream cults, brutal monoliths dressed for pride parades. You can't be mad when they're so happy. Say no to homophobia, the fear of luxury apartments corporate chameleons in rainbow camo, having architectural visions like the psychedelic 60s but with hipsters for hippies, GLA for LSD and free market for free love. Riding the tide mill, a new wave of Deptford demolitions is flooding the banks of the Thames and the bankers of the wharf. Get out fast before the canary croaks. Corporate care bears burn bridges with rainbows, symbols of individuality too transient to build a community on. Dorothy asks for some place where there isn't any trouble before she wizards off to Oz. Inject a rainbow. And it keeps the druggies out too. They can't catch their main lines below the rails anymore. 
rainbow one, rainbow two, or rainbow three. What a choice, as long as it's one of these three. And the rainbow is the icon of freedom under Deptford Railway Arches at a company called MoMA. They're dissecting all the rainbows to give you something authentic, something like MoMA used to make porridges all feathery and grayscale like penguin chicks feeding on maternal regurgitations and the second hand of the second hand market up by the albany traces this powdered food's lineage to a pot of coleman's nutrient supplement and under adjacent arches the bodybuilders of commando temple sip on something stronger outsourcing digestion like pre-weaned newborns bawling into rubber fonts at their buff baptisms at Commando Temple, lifting your own gravestone makes you feel more alive. An onlooker watches a prolapsed colon creep through lycra, no pants to take the pressure when you're going commando. Gut-conscious locals forage the flea market for fermented fodder. The vintage clothing trend now extends to food, apparently. Prehistoric pickled eggs poached from probate clearances, yeast of the recently deceased... All these tap rooms, gym bars and beer fests... Someone complains, mourning the spirits of the high street's lost pubs, 16 of them. A tap room's not a pub, it's just a drinking establishment with beer and people and laughing. And okay, well, it's a bit like a pub, I suppose, but it's not, It's. I mean, it's not proper, is it? Proper, a word used on the packaging of pies, crisps and beer, seasoned with a hint of nationalism. Freepropabeer.com shouts a blind drunk blind tasting campaign for Meantime Brewery in Greenwich. Lambic authenticity is what we crave and Deptford is blooming with it. On this one street you can buy a hundred types of flour, spelt, yam, plantain and there's one called Gary. Maybe Gary Lineker has branched out from crisps to other starches. The most inventive is a blend of fish, tea and soup called fish tea soup. I catch a market trader trying to pass kettle scum off as the bougie new flour. Gluten-free, he'll sell you the Tums afterwards for your intolerance. Regurgitated from 1996, pre-loved oils, salt and germaline come with free DNA of predecessors, antisocial networking, ancestral actimal, pots of mayonnaise not sure how to spell themselves, the appeal of the erroneous. A sexy vegetable on the high street is loving its curves, flaunts them in the market sometimes. I saw it with its lippy on. The veggies in the Asda tow the party line, though, green uniforms and discount dog tags. On Deptford's second-hand stalls, a beloved cat is worth nine ninety nine, but a special nan, eleven ninety nine. It's all relative. Is it the special nan from Little Nan's Bar, perhaps, I wonder? She's got a second branch now in Warren Street. I saw it. They're, they're growing a family tree and they'll be everywhere soon. Little Nando's, because we love an ode to oldies. Her mum's curtains would look lovely in here. Inverted commas to wrap around the ornamentation of another generation. Tongue-in-cheek, cheeky, but you mean it, though. More is Moorish. Is that an empty shop up the market yard or is it a concept store? Paired back to the plumbing and the concrete, their products are so rare that they don't even physically exist. I saw the Emperor's new clothes on sale in a boutique uptown the other day, on the same street as the new little Nan's bar, the one that calls food Eats. And thin air is Britain's biggest export, of course, because all the shipping containers importing things, they all go back hollow overseas. Empty shells. And Deptford Market is full of exoskeletons, filed under silicone with the charges and sealants, ways of sticking together like the muddy foreshore of the creek. Life rubble washes up at regular tides, bringing new wreckage of lives that reach their end. Manzi's eels and lobos barracudas are in the swim. Electric culture clash of elongated bodies wrestling for survival like a snake v mongoose YouTube. Those without Wi-Fi come with fireworks in case of lost signal at sea. And some have retired, bought a boat, and sailed away. You can hook a duck, but you might get someone else. Funeral pamphlets arranged like an estate agent's window, looking for new hosts. Complete with their family photos, cold keepsakes, and past perfect plans for a holiday in Cuba. Everything you need to move into your new life in their old life. A set of sunrises, a rise of sunsets. Peter's stalls up by the Albany there, a mausoleum, and he's Tomb Raider without the body. 
You can earn the ashes of an invisible man, acquire the skull of an emoji, buy a novelty landmine foot pedal, pick your cause of death, or take home a Playmobil apocalypse. Up the high street, the living reminders that they're conscious, branded brains quoting Japanese conceptualist Onkawara, whether they know it or not, who sent telegrams in the 70s saying, I'm still alive, hasn't sent one since 2014. He's dead now, of course. Deal with it. You've got your own problems. The Double Jab Boxing Club in Fordham Park has a slogan. Jab, don't stab. Encouraging punching as an antidote to violence. Seems paradoxical, but it works. Life can be hard in precarious times, but we'll train the kids up for economic balancing acts and build monuments to how peaceful shark class felt how serene lion class were and how tranquil jaguar class reported to be, wishful thinking of desperate teachers in the hope it tames them. But predators can spot your Achilles heel a mile away. The Council Redevelopment Office has tipexed the A and the ES from the Achilles Street sign now so that it reads Chill Street to calm people down in the face of impending demolitions. Perhaps it's a similar method to Tottenham Council who painted a waterfall on the notorious Broadwater Farm estate after the 80s riots. But it's not very chill now, on Chill Street. Waiting for diggers to arrive, they are promised rainbow apartments in the sky. And you aspire to aim higher, but is aspiring to aim enough to strive towards hoping to try to want to wish your dreams? Hope and glory seem so far from achievable that the clergy has had to put a laminated sign on their door to remind us it's a church, as though the Virgin Mary, pointy roof and crosses were not a giveaway, just so passers-by don't think it's a Holy Spirit-themed gym bar or something, best to be clear. You shouldn't make assumptions, said Our Lady of the Assumption. In the Deptford documentary, archive footage of a nightclub that was in the church crypt years ago shows the priest partying with locals wearing fancy dress, and one has come as a pregnant nun. He doesn't seem offended, he's seen it all, anything to keep the community close. I walk past a woman who's playfully punching a shopkeeper who won't sell her the jeans that she wants for less. Nothing says friend like a dig in the ribs. And Kim's news on the high street favours the personal approach too with cards so specialised that you can trace their target market to the only one golf-obsessed Caribbean grandma who's celebrating her 40th wedding anniversary in Deptford this year. Greetings for every conceivable life moment and a few flavourless ones thrown in for strangers. Clip art beer for him and chocolate for her. Kim's News is the only place where you can buy iced gems without the icing. Tiny digestive biscuits scaled down to go in your minuscule apartment. And they've got the minute studio flat bed to match. Want an official dog selfie jigsaw in 3D? You know where to go. The director of Deptford X Festival, he went to Kim's to buy a notepad. He had to choose between a gold sparkly one with the words Get it girl! emblazoned on the cover or a mock police officer one. He found it hard to choose, and this is why Kim's makes the world better, because there's nothing boring in there. Even the tiny dry biscuits identify as gems, and the Transformers wear their trans fats with pride, and so they should. They've got L plates in the motoring section, and L plates in the hen party section. Which are you? You get to choose. A soul is not generic. You've got to grow your own. Just when I thought Kim's window display of unicorn eggs and 1930s greeting cards couldn't get any more idiosyncratic, they swapped them for, of all things, a tiny dentist chair. Where did they even get it? Perhaps they identified the absence of one in the dentists up the road. They'd done their market research thoroughly. It's not even a dentist anymore, it's an aesthetics and smile centre. Aesthetics and smiles, art and psychology, the other goldsmiths. You can top up everything at Kim's News, even your 90s Pez dispenser. And if you want Murder Monthly, a photo of an angel, a key ring that says grumpy old man or sex bomb girlfriend, a ship in a bottle, eyelash curlers, a taxidermy dinosaur or a skateboard. They sell all these things and too much more. 
if that TV retail guru, Mary Porters, if she visited, she'd turn its fortunes around by changing its name and putting a big sign up. Museum of the 90s, it would read, and it would feature in Time Out alongside a ball pit bar and crisp festivals and, and Little Nan's Bar. Back in the market, I comforted a Zen statue of a woman having a total meltdown, surrounded by all this mess. You've got to surf and channel the chaos. I buy a bunch of obsolete remote controls from Ali's stall to make me feel more in control, but he finds me later and he asks to see in my bag and he takes one back and sells it to someone else who's buying a TV. Can he even do that? I'd already bought it. He can do what he likes. Tarek, the inventor who I met, he says that Ali's got loads of kids to support and so I don't mind that he says that I pay more because I'm an artist and stuff is worth more to me and he's he's probably right. Tarek is buying parts for machines and zip wires that he's building and he's excavating his garden so he can fit them in and we eat lunch together at Hullabaloo and plot graphs on his phone to calculate how the price of an umbrella at Ali's stall is proportional to the probability of rain. And when it does rain, the sodden stalls spoil. But I'm haggling over a hole puncher that says, Bob's hands off on it in Tipex. It's worth nothing, I say. It's, it's rained on anyway. Who else would buy it? Bob the Boss's premium hole puncher gave him status in the office. Its social, psychological, sentimental value was high. Now that Bob is dead and the hole puncher is in the house clearance section of the market, it only has functional value. 50p from Peter's stall up by the Albany. But if we find out that Bob's surname was Marley, its emotional and social value are greatly amplified again. Thus, Peter can afford to buy more of those wonderful hats that give him status as king of the market. Tarek and I watch a video of physicist Richard Feynman explaining how he can't answer why two magnets repel or attract. If you try to follow anything up, you go deeper and deeper in various directions, he says. And I revel in the unravelling improbability of the market. In its own way, the market is mindfulness or find no mess. Hours are lost in foraging, no goal or higher calling. I'm guided by someone else's prayers, odes to their DI. Why, why, why? I borrow another woman's purpose. Failed missions of authorless pens which seem to imply to my touchy feminist side that by default women lack one, unless the purpose is chocolate. And men just want their purpose to be bigger than their mates. And when it's not, they seek vents for their frustration. Corporate punch bags, desktop premonitions of the moment they smash up their office. A scaled down croquet set that makes them feel like an aristocratic giant. And what looks like a fuckable champagne cork. Anything to feel on top. And Deptford's on the up. But it's still in touch with the bottom. Scatological symbolism applauds when you perform a movement. A little witch's hat is ominous of orifices. It's in Deptford, we're in the gutter, looking at the stars, but the reverse of that, we're, we're in the stars, looking at the gutter, on the top floor of the tinderbox, looking down at the market, and when they raise the tinderbox apartments to the ground in 2080, they'll see Deptford's true colours, a mixed-up rainbow. Mix the multicolours together, you see, and it, it gets a little muddy, doesn't it? We're up shit creek with views of HSBC Tower, and we don't care if your mum had lovely curtains, because ours are Dorothy's from Croydon Ikea. We've all got them. A rainbow can't collapse, because it's not really there. All that is solid melts into air. I always wanted to end a thing on, with that like chiming effect. It's probably like a, a, a no-no for some people. Um, so shall we do something? Uh, I was realised like how s how local that video is to the point where there's references that maybe don't even translate to uh, people that haven't been there. But yeah, I really like the idea of being a really a local artist as well. Like, um, and for it speaking to a in audience of Deptford but I think it still works outside as well to an extent because 
that those questions are going on everywhere really like all of the market well here all across London anyway specifically that kind of tussle of power between uh, people that were there before pe people that are trying to get a piece of it um, so let's do something interactive did um, did anyone bring any objects um, did you oh cool well um, so yeah let's maybe just kind of let's sit on the stage or just like come up here and if you brought an object we can put it how, how long have we got get up and put your objects on the stage if you brought anything um don't really know what we're gonna do with them go about 20 minutes okay to play maybe i can not have shall i take this off or, oh no it's all right i'll leave it on i'll just be talking really loud <laughs> Nice, they're quite sound based, aren't they? Um, that, yeah, great. Yeah, just leave it here and then we can, maybe we can all come up closer. There's lots of, oh wow, it's such, it is a sound course. <laughs> nah. Oh, you happen to have one. That is really handy, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think like people come up here and let's just gather around and sort of you can sit on the stage or sit around and it's not the best place for this exact type of workshopping, but I just wanted to see what we've got and try to um, work together to create uh, some kind of improvised uh, sound piece. Um, a lot of my work is narrative-based, isn't it? So it might be that we also create some kind of story, but I feel like these are such great objects for making sound with. Um, so, hmm, keep, if you haven't put your thing here, do that now. And let's try and make some connections between the objects for starters, and then we might use our mobile phones to um, record sound. Oh, that was a good one. That, that's like very kind of theatrical, I feel like. The abandoned cup of tea. Shall we try to make some connections between them? Can anyone see something that might connect to another thing? Anything we can put up here now, or maybe it's a handy wall. Um, well, there's two. There's the keys and the lock of the key. So they're kind of the wrong key, I suppose. I, like musically, uh, the idea of a key. I like that. I like the pun of that. Like, because there's lots of musical things, but but perhaps that also fits into that category of something that's musical. This is a kind of microphone, isn't it? And this is. Oh. <laughs> this is so good. I want that. I'm having that. <laughs> you can record on it. Oh. Make it stop. <laughs> um, so these are sort of the same for me in, in some ways, aren't they? I don't know. As, you know. This reminds me of those... <laughs> this reminds me of those... Um, you know that very basic um, kind of telephone thing that you can make out of two cups and some string. Sort of feels like that, but without um, the other cup. But it doesn't really need it because it's channeling some kind of alien um, environment. I don't know why aliens sound like this or who discovered that. Or perhaps it's just that sound when it's in a uh, when it's not on Earth um, has interference in some way. I'm quite interested in wildlife documentary sound effects, um, other connections between things. These are sort of hearts, aren't they? And sort of end up these hearts that have been that have rusted for a long time. Uh, but let's see what this goes on with. Um, the stranglers closer to stranglers. And no, maybe for me, the these might be connected in that you've got the rope and the strangling, but then it's some kind of um, 
the, it's, it's a love song in a way as well, but a sort of melancholic love song. Um, this is blackcurrant and glycerine pastels. Um, it looks like it's from not now, from quite a long time ago. Uh, it's it's native to Borough, so not that far from here. And one pastel is dissolved slowly in the mouth as required. Um, is there any other kind of? Well, I suppose there's the tea and the and this, and this is completely different in that it feels like it's not primarily for functional use, but somehow it has some kind of ritual use. Does anyone know what this is? So it's to make sound it as, okay. And what do you normally use to make sound? Ah, uh, really? So you can use a different kind of object to do that. Is that like a tuning fork thing? Yeah, okay. Um, so what I think we should do is go f like take kind of five minutes to on our phones record um, record the space but using objects you can work in groups or you can work on your own and just use the objects to uh, to kind of explore the room um, so it might be that this is used to kind of get inside of something or even just sounds that it's making um, using your mobile phone recorder have most people got a phone that has a like a recording device or some something on it that they can record with i'm sure that you can find something um and use your objects or if you don't have an object just try to use the space itself uh so no talking for the next uh maybe if you want to get into groups take two minutes now to get into groups or you could do it on your own um and start recording then um, just anything improvised like relating to the room and whichever of the objects you've got um, and see if we can kind of create a portrait of our studios and the room um, through you could use the pig thing as well if you want and then we'll play it back to each other someone will be the um, what's it called um, the person with a stick that the conductor yeah and we will like tap people on the heads to say turn off or turn on as we're playing it back. So it's kind of, I don't really have any idea what I'm doing here, but I think it's going to be amazing. So get into your groups. We've got 30 seconds to do that. And then no talking after that. Just start recording things. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, so you've got 10 minutes, 10 minutes to record sound, but please don't talk because otherwise that will uh, interrupt the sound. If you need silence, you could always just pop out there and, um, and record. So starting from now, no talking for 10 minutes.
I think that was so good and enough. Um, so press stop and then um, let's all get around where we were. And um, maybe we don't need to have someone turning it on and off. Just as you want to press. So, pr so press play on your recording, but um, you can stop whenever you want. So kind of as if you were making the decision to either stand up or sit down. Once I was in a workshop where we had to either stand up or sit down and everyone did that in different, it, it became quite arbitrary when, like, w why you might make that decision, but somehow it got its own rhythm. Um, so let's just press play and pause as we go um, starting. And, th and maybe we can, if anyone wants to amplify that with the, um, With the, m the mic, we c um, if you want to bring your um, your phone closer to this at any time, then I'll put that on there. But let's go now.
ended really naturally. Amazing. That was actually the best thing ever. I can't believe you actually understand sound so well that you can... It is so much better than I ever thought that I could be. It was like this amazingly rich kind of inventive space, sculpture thing. Um, brilliant. Right. Well, have we got time just for any questions or is it time to sort of go... Just for like a couple of minutes. Okay, so any questions? <laughs> You just bought a sheep at auction, like you know when someone itches their face. And Any questions? Yes. I have questions, but sure. Um, yeah, um, I really like the way you kind of approach um, your art pieces. Is it sometimes when you're creating art, is it improvisations or just ideas that you kind of see out and about? Or yeah, I think it is very improvised. It is very much like getting out and about and then noticing. And often it, it takes quite a long time of being on location in order to to notice and sort of get a sense of what maybe the idea is. But it definitely comes together through collecting fragments and noticings and like, yeah, bits of ideas. And it's only then when it I sit down with it all, I like start to tease out the meaning of it, but it absolutely doesn't have a plan first. Mm. So some people work very much to a plan, but mm. the others, it, I think of it like cooking. Some people cook following a recipe and they're very methodical and others just like have a feel for the thing and and sort of get a sense of what might work well together and invent stuff that way. So I'm definitely the second type of person. Yeah, are you or do you? Yeah, yeah I really like to um, explore ideas and, and see if the art comes or the idea concept comes after. But yeah, gathering yeah. in like objects that interest you, I think that's really cool. Yeah, like, yeah. Work I with it. And sometimes I think kind of academic um, contexts find so you're always supposed to be like proving your research and kind of showing that the, it's like critically rigorous. But sometimes I don't even know what I'm doing until, mm. and then I wonder whether that means it's not critically rigorous, but actually it's kind of like a ways of channeling what you already knew. So I think there's different levels of knowing and some of those come from uh, kind of accidents that trigger off something that, um, that, that was there already, but it's definitely kind of field work process rather than a let's storyboard something from mm -hmm. and then like follow it through. So, mm -hmm. but it seemed like you all had the ability to improvise and not feel scared by that like did it generally feel quite exciting to do that and to mess around yeah definitely. Okay. I, I think <laughs> more messing around is always good and it's a thing that in school we're told stop messing around but actually messing around is what scientists do is what artists do a lot of the time it's musicians that freedom I think is really important otherwise it just feels like work in a way that makes me not want to do it. I feel like there has to be an act of sort of rebellion, rebellion in a small way for me to be excited by a project. And I think kind of like wandering and loitering, like loitering is, is a crime, like is an actual crime. Like, um, and so kind of doing something with no purpose is already s a small act of rebellion. So yeah, I think I like the resistant aspect of messing. Um, yeah, any other? Well, that it, it kind of, I what you said there about um, rigor, academic rigor in a way, kind of leads to a question I was thinking of as well, which in, in terms of thinking about students and whether you have anything to say in particular about uh, how you talk about this kind of relational work if you want a grant or a show or, you mm. know what I mean? Like some people, 
some places where you might want to uh, exhibit or whatever um, will have an understanding of it, but mm -hmm. you can't guarantee that if you're applying for an Arts Council grant, for example, that there's going to yeah. be someone on the panel who understands what this is about and why it's, you know, why it should get a grant. So I just wonder if you have any <laughs> like <laughs> advice ways or, or ways it. that you talk about it uh, that are, th that suit those kind of circumstances. Yeah, so when I've I've only ever applied for one research and development thing through the Arts Council, which I didn't get. But I've done lots of Arts Council funded stuff through other organisations. So maybe I don't know how to describe what I'm doing. But I think that um, it, uh, it you have to tick loads of boxes when you're doing the Arts Council application, which is kind of exciting for me because it means that Firstly, there's been a shift in that now they're like really trying to get new audiences to see artwork, and that's there. It comes from a very right-wing neoliberal idea that somehow the taxpayer is paying for it, and therefore it has to like heal the world. What you're doing, you have to be this kind of sort of I don't know. You have to have a, a use. Um, but I think the result is actually really exciting, which is that uh, art. It's acknowledged that the audience of art doesn't have to just be this privileged, educated, already knowing about art audience. Um, and so that's re that's who I want to talk to anyway. So I think like some of the box ticking that's involved with trying to, uh, with doing socially engaged practice, when I do workshoppy stuff or things in public space, even with like the shopping center, and the Deptford video, although there was a video, and that's sort of the bit I'm most excited about, really, for me, there was loads of other socially engaged stuff along the way. So I did, for Deptford, I did a workshop with uh, youngish people with disabilities who we made this costume, which was a mascot for Deptford, and then I had to, like, patrol around Deptford wearing the ridiculous costume. And it was a really great kind of, studio space for me all of the uh all of the working with the community thing i feel like it can be really patronizing if you're a socially engaged artist who somehow thinks that they're like going to parachute in and like save the people like and uh, there's always that hierarchy thing that somehow the artist is is like cleverer or a genius of some kind and i just don't think that that is true um it's just that an artist makes space in their life for um, a kind of creative inquiry that maybe most people either don't have the luxury for or just don't, or they get their kicks in other ways or they, or they just, uh, they haven't, they, ha they haven't for whatever reason made that space in their life to explore. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think like all of the stuff that could be box ticking uh, is actually just a really useful studio space for me and the develop of works which are a bit more selfish, which are maybe entirely made by me. Like most filmmakers would have a whole team. I just have me and my my wardrobe and my like all the sound is recorded in my wardrobe, which I would like to change. Um, but it kind of works enough for it to be okay. Just soft, soft space like, and phone. like. Um, so yeah, it, it's very selfish in some ways in that I don't even collaborate in the making of those videos, but all the processes around it are, uh, definitely tap into that artist as a person that kind of like helps and heals and, um, creates community, temporary communities, like re, re activates existing communities. So I don't know whether it answers the question, but I don't really know how I, talk about it. I don't think in applications people necessarily want to hear like the academic, critical, sort of theoretical side. They more want to see how many people will it affect and how many people will see it, how many people will be involved with it, how many artists will get paid because of it. It's very like rational, I think, their approach. But um, I really want to think a bit more, and I'm going to have time to do this soon, about you know, I reread Claire Bishop's writings about socially engaged practice and her critique of the social artist and really work out whether I'm still optimistic about the idea of 
working directly with community or in public space, which I am, and I think it, but then I also feel like it always doesn't quite get there. Uh, like with the wall piece, playing the wall, it was a mostly art audience and it was in a gallery, but anyone could have been there. But it didn't feel like they necessarily came up with anything. Like they didn't, I didn't, feel like they were free whereas I felt like you were you guys were free here like doing something that started to get really exciting so sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't I don't really know wha why it works or whether I want to pursue that kind of way of working ultimately um, but I think it slightly comes down to an interest in class and like as someone whose parents are definitely working class but have become middle class who then was brought up working class to a bit until they then got better jobs and then was sort of middle class and then went to Oxford where it was really, really, really middle slash upper class. Um, and then being in the art world, but also like I've worked in care work. I've done so many different types of jobs. I feel like I don't know where I position myself. And I really like that because it kind of means you're always in the wrong context and so you're always kind of outside of even doing comedy as an artist or, you know, doing the thing that I'm not an expert in. It's like I become a jack of all trades and a master of none. And somehow that is important, that exteriority or not feeling like you necessarily fit in to something was really useful for me. But I haven't yet worked out how to properly academically kind of be the art critic about that. Um, so I'll get back to you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I can. Uh, I I will just talk at length if anyone asks me another one. So don't ask Any, me another one. Any more? <laughs> uh, I think we, we are, with we one are word running out of time. So unless there's uh, burning questions, um, I think. Well, you we'll can always email me. My it's on my website is louiseashcroft.org. Um, it, my email is on there. So, um, I, I want to be quite like open to connecting with people. Um, so just say hello if you want to. Um, that's great. Thank you, Louise. Cool. Thanks so much. <laughs>